Chapter 13 covers the process of translation, which is the, the final step in the expression of the information contained in our genomes. So we've discussed the process of transcription, which is the first step, taking information that is encoded in our DNA and making an RNA copy of that information. The process of translation is when cells and their intracellular machinery utilize the, the components that we're gonna be talking about here in a minute to interpret or read that RNA strand that was made uh, when a gene region was transcribed, okay? So when a gene is transcribed, you get a messenger RNA molecule after that processing that you learned about in chapter 12. And going from that messenger RNA molecule to a functional protein is what we're talking about here. Now, the first thing I want to make clear to you is that RNA is a pretty large category of molecules that are comprised of these ribonucleic acids. Right? We learned about that much earlier in the course. All RNA, every bit of RNA that you find in your cells is created through the process of transcription of a region of DNA, okay? So we learned about transcription in chapter 12, all the RNA that is found in our cells and in cells of many bacteria that have DNA, that RNA is produced through transcription, okay? Now, it's not only coding regions of genes that are transcribed, okay? We're going to talk about that type of RNA, but that RNA that is produced through the transcription of coding regions of a gene that has introns and exons, and you get rid of the introns, and you have a mature mRNA, those are the molecules that are translated. Those are the molecules that contain the information necessary to assemble a chain of amino acids together into what we call a polypeptide. And that polypeptide can be configured into the functional protein. Those are mRNA, and we've learned about transcription through examples in which mRNA was produced. But I need you to recognize that there are other types of RNA that we're gonna talk about here in a moment, uh, primarily rRNA and tRNA, these types of RNA are also made through the process of transcription. They are RNA copies of a region of the DNA genome. What they are not is something that is going to be translated in a short period of time and a string of amino acids turned into a protein based on the information contained in these R or T RNA molecules, okay? Our RNA or ribosomal RNA, their function is in the structure of a ribosome. They form, or in part, form the ribosomes that are conducting the translational process that we'll be reading about or learning about here as well. tRNA, or transfer RNA, are the molecules that carry the amino acid to the ribosome when translation is happening. So we're going to go over all of this but one of the great confusions that arises when students are learning about the process of translation is that the only thing that is, results from transcription is mRNA, and that's not true. The only way we can make these tRNAs and rRNAs is by making an RNA copy of a portion of the genome. It's just that the parts of the genome that have the information that needs to be copied in order to make an rRNA or a tRNA, those regions of the genome are there so these RNA molecules can be made, and that is the end product. For genes, like alcohol dehydrogenase that I've spoken to you about before as an example, those, the end product is not the mRNA, but the end product is what we get from translating that messenger RNA molecule, okay? So now we're gonna dig into the first component uh, that's new to you in this chapter, and that is the structure of the ribosome, okay? Because when we are translating a messenger RNA molecule, there are a few things that we need, and the first is the ribosome. 
So the ribosome is illustrated in your text as this sort of triangular, three-dimensional looking molecule that you see up top, this monosome. And what you first need to recognize is that there are two different portions or subunits of a ribosome. There's a larger one, the bottom, and a smaller one, the top, okay? Each of those has a characteristic size, and you can see underneath that the large subunit of prokaryotic ribosomes is made up of something called the 23S rRNA. So that's a stretch of rRNA that is long, 2,904 nucleotides long. So the large subunit of the ribosome is the 23S rRNA, the 5S rRNA, which is much shorter, and then 31 proteins. Altogether, those two rRNAs and the 31 proteins form this large subunit, okay? The small subunit is made up of the 16S rRNA and 21 proteins. So if you think about what's needed to produce this monosome, this big functional ribosome up top, you need to transcribe the gene for 23S rRNA, the 5S gene, the 16S gene, and you get those three different rRNAs. Okay, once you have those, you incorporate these additional proteins and you have a functional large and small subunit, okay? So there are regions in the genomes of prokaryotes that code for 23S, 5S, and 16S. These are different regions. And if you think back to that mitochondrial genome that I showed you long ago, it looked like a circle with a bunch of rings on it. And one of you actually asked me if you needed to learn or memorize it from one of the earlier chapters. This is when we learned about the endosymbiotic theory. If you go back and look at the genes that are on that mitochondrial genome, there are a 12S and a 16S gene on there that are ribosomal subunits for the mitochondrion, okay? All right, so eukaryotic ribosomes are not all that dissimilar, okay? We have a large monosome that is comprised of the fusion of the large and small subunit. The large subunit is made up of a bunch of proteins and a couple rRNAs, in this case three. And then the small subunit is comprised of a single rRNA and a number of proteins, okay? So we're gonna get all into the function of these different subunits and these little notches that you see in them. But for the moment, I need you to understand that this is the structure of a ribosome at its finest level. So you've probably to this point only really seen them in the context of these bumps that are on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and that's true, that's where they reside. Uh, but when we dig into their function, we have to understand how their structure contributes to that function. That's why we're introducing this here. Now, the other form of RNA I need to introduce you to, as you're now familiar with rRNA, to the extent that you need to be, as well as mRNA from chapter 12, the next uh, that's important is tRNA, or transfer RNA, okay? Now, if I were to draw a schematic diagram of a tRNA, there are two ways it can be illustrated in two dimensions or three. And this is a two-dimensional illustration of a tRNA molecule. And I want you to look at this and think of each of those little orange colored rectangles or polygons as representing a single nucleotide. And you can see at the very top, those three nucleotides at the very tip there, C, G, and I, have been illustrated, and at the bottom, the CCA and the G have been illustrated. The others aren't really shown. It's not a huge deal, okay? Now, there are a couple things I want you to take away from this two-dimensional model of a tRNA molecule. The first is that you'll notice that portions of this tRNA molecule are folded back upon itself and you see these dashed lines between what I've told you are the nucleotides, or the bases. Now when tRNA is created through the process of transcription, you're creating a single-stranded RNA molecule. So messenger RNA is single-stranded, ribosomal RNA is single-stranded, but what you're seeing here in this tRNA is that some of these regions of the tRNA are double-stranded, and they achieve that 
through folding back upon themselves and binding to complementary nucleotides in their own sequence. And so what you will see is in these regions where these dashed lines indicate hydrogen bonds holding complementary nucleotides together, is that there are regions of the tRNA molecule that are complementary to another region further down the molecule. Okay? If we look on this towards the bottom, just to the left of where it says acceptor arm, those seven nucleotides right next to acceptor arm are obviously and necessarily complementary to the seven nucleotides further upstream just to the left where they're hydrogen bound to them. Okay? So what this tells you is that portions of the tRNA molecule have to be complementary to other portions further down in order to create these areas where it is hydrogen bound to itself creating a somewhat double-stranded molecule. These regions are called stems, just like a stem on a plant. Okay? And at the tip, where the molecule bends back upon itself, we have these loops. Okay? So you see a loop to the left without much indication of any detail there, a loop to the right, and then this loop up at the top that is labeled the anticodon. For our purposes, the other loops don't matter. You don't need to learn variable loop or any of these other arms. Okay? What I want you to know is what an anticodon is. Okay? So the, we've learned the term codon before. Now what we're learning about is the anticodon. Okay? So this will become clear in a minute as we dig further into translation. But understand that at the codon, there are three nucleotides, and they are not bound to anything, right? They are not part of one of the stems where the molecule is hydrogen bound to itself. The other portion of the tRNA molecule that I want you to be aware of is the three prime end down there, which is the amino acid binding site. So at present, what we're looking at is just a two-dimensional model of a tRNA molecule that does not have an amino acid bound to it. But we can see that site where that molecule would bind. Now this two-dimensional model, if we were to consider this tRNA molecule in its three-dimensional form, it might look something more like this. Not quite as easy to interpret, but now that you understand that two-dimensional model and have some understanding of that, you know what these orange crossbars represent that span what look to be two different strands of nucleic acid. The fact that they're the same nucleic acid strand has no effect on the fact that they're actually hydrogen bound to one another and are indeed double stranded in those stem regions. Okay? Now look up at the anticodon, you will see those three little fingers sticking off. And what those are, are the three bases of the anticodon that are not part of any stem region. They are not bound to any nucleotides in this tRNA molecule. They are available for complementary pairing with other nucleotides, and that's what happens during translation. You can also see here the three prime end that is the amino acid binding site, and it is available for the binding of amino acids. Okay. So let's think about what happens to these tRNA molecules that makes them so useful in the process of translation. Well, it starts with the charging of the tRNA. And by charging, I mean adding an appropriate amino acid to that three prime end of the tRNA molecule. You can see on the right side of this figure here for the bottom two steps, there is a tRNA molecule drawn as a orange squiggly line in the first one, there's just a three prime end hanging off. And in the second, there's an amino acid attached to the end of that tRNA molecule, okay? So in the charging of TNA, what I mean by charging is that we are adding an amino acid to the tRNA molecule. This process occurs through a relatively, relatively straightforward interaction between an amino acid and a molecule called amino acyl tRNA synthase. Okay, and so this amino acyl tRNA synthetase is an enzyme that 
when powered by ATP, will allow the attachment of this amino acid from the activated enzyme complex that you see in step two. It becomes, uh, it interacts with the tRNA molecule and will attach that amino acid to the three prime end of the tRNA, okay? It's important for these tRNAs to be used that they have with them an amino acid, okay? Now, what I want you to think about is when you looked at those codon charts and learned about the different nucleotides that code for very specific amino acids, how did that actually work in the real world? Well, this is how it works. Remember those three little uh, bases that are sticking off the anticodon at the top of the tRNA molecule? Well, the nucleotides that are there, the specific nucleotides and their specific order and sequence is what determines which amino acid gets attached to the tRNA molecule, okay? This attachment of amino acids is not random. It's very specific depending on the nucleotides that are present in the anticodon of the tRNA. So once you understand that the players in this are the ribosome, the messenger RNA, and the tRNA, so the things on the left and the bottom right, okay, now we're going to discuss how these interact with one another to facilitate this process of translation. Remember, we're trying to get information from that messenger RNA and turn that into a protein, okay? But in order to do that, we've got to read or translate the information contained in that messenger RNA. That reading is the job of the ribosome, okay? Now, the tRNA molecule is the molecule that brings to the ribosome the amino acids and allows the ribosome to assemble those amino acids one with another until you end up with this long chain of amino acids that's called a polypeptide. And that polypeptide is what will become our protein, okay? So there are two other things I want to introduce you here to. These are initiation and elongation factors. And these are cofactors or elements that participate in this process and they do the two things that you probably suspect they do. They initiate the process of translation and then they facilitate the elongation of the polypeptide, okay? This chain of amino acids. All right, so how does translation begin? If we had all of these things in a cell, how on earth does translation begin? Translation is initiated with the assistance of these initiation factors in conjunction with the small subunit of the ribosome. With those two working together, the small subunit of the ribosome interacts with and will attach to messenger RNA molecules. So you can see here the messenger RNA molecule is interacting with the small subunit of the ribosome. And what you will notice is that the very first codon, AUG, is lined up in the P site of the small subunit of the ribosome. There are three sites within the ribosome. You may have noticed on the previous slide, and you will see it here in a couple slides. There are three sites, E, P, and A. We're going to be reading them left to right. Okay, the, um, the EPA sites, the way I remember it is the Environmental Protection Agency, EB, EPA, it's simple to remember, okay? So the process of translation begins when AUG, which you should remember as the sequence for the start codon from our codon chart, AUG, it's codes for the amino acid methionine, MET. And on the previous slide, you may have noticed that that is the amino acid attached to the tRNA, okay? And this tRNA molecule that you see here with UAC in the anticodon has on its three prime end a methionine amino acid, okay? So with 
the alignment of AUG, the start codon, of the messenger RNA into the P site of the small subunit of the ribosome, we're ready to roll. Okay? So the tRNA molecule with this methionine amino acid attached to it comes in binds to, hydrogen bonds to, the AUG star codon in the messenger RNA. UAC is complementary to AUG, okay? The two sequences are anti-parallel to one another, okay? UAC is running in the opposite direction of AUG, okay? And these are now bound together and we are ready to begin the process of translation. Once this tRNA methionine is bound to the messenger RNA molecule, star codon, in the P site, the initiation factors are done and they go away. Okay? The initiation factors helped also to bring in the large subunit of the ribosome before they disappear. And you will notice that the large subunit comes in up underneath the small subunit. The P site is now a complete chamber that you can see. And obviously this is a heavily cartoonized schematic for the purpose of illustration. Uh, but this is a good way of thinking about the way in which all of these molecules interact with one another. So now the tRNA methionine is in the P site, the polymerization site. We have an empty A site to the right and an empty E site to the left. Okay, And so what's going to happen is this next tRNA molecule that is compatible and complementary to UUC, the codon that is sitting in the A site of the messenger RNA, that new tRNA molecule that has AAG in the anticodon is going to come into the A site. It is accepted, A accepted, into the ribosome, and that is facilitated by these elongation factors, okay, that you can see there on the bottom right. So elongation factors bring to the ribosome the correct tRNA molecules that are complementary to the codon in the A site, okay. So remember, here's what we have. We have the ribosome that has three sites, the E, P, and the A. A is where the new tRNA is accepted. P is where the polymerization or the gluing of two amino acids together happens. And the E, the exit site, is where the old tRNA gets kicked out to. Okay, And you'll see this here in a moment as we continue the process of translation. So here, We've brought in the, we started this whole thing with the tRNA methionine that was complementary to the start codon in the P site. We brought in with an elongation factor the next tRNA that's complementary to codon number two in the A site. Now that we have these two together, they each have an amino acid. And what the messenger RNA has told it, the ribosome, is that the two amino acids attached to these two tRNAs should be put together in this order, okay? And so what happens in this polymerization site is that a peptide bond is formed, okay? A peptide bond is formed between the two amino acids and the amino acid that was on the first codon in the P site is removed from the three prime end of that tRNA. The tRNA alone gets pushed to the exit site, it's done. It's no longer charged. It can play no greater role or no further role in the extension of our amino acid chain or our polypeptide. Its role in this step of translation is done. We now have a peptide bond formed between the two amino acids and they are both attached to the three prime end of this tRNA molecule with AAG and the anticodon that used to be in the A site and now I got moved down one spot to the P site, okay? So I want you to think of the ribosome as this decoder that is sliding down the ribosome one codon at a time. And as the codon moves from the A site to the P site, the tRNA is hydrogen bonded to it. It moves with it, okay? And it pushes the tRNA that was in the P site out to the exit site. But it has taken, if you will, 
the amino acid that was bound to that tRNA, and it is now part of the polypeptide on this second tRNA. But now look what we have. We have an empty A site again with a new codon, GGU. So what is complementary to GGU in RNA? That is going to be a, a, sorry, CCA. Okay, so now we're looking for a tRNA molecule that has CCA, which is complementary to the codon in the A site. An elongation factor brings that tRNA molecule with its own unique amino acid attached to it. If you want to know what the amino acid is that would be attached to this tRNA, you would look in your codon chart for the codon GGU. And whatever that GGU codon codes for is what is going to be attached on this CCA tRNA. So this tRNA moves into the A site. We now have two tRNAs, one in the P site, one in the A site, again. And what's going to happen is, remember the same thing that we saw in this first step. What is attached to the tRNA in the P site is gonna get moved off of it, removed from the three prime end, and attached to the tRNA amino acid in the A site, okay? And the AAG tRNA is gonna get kicked to the exit site. So note here the orientation. We've got a, a green amino acid on the A site tRNA, and we have the purple amino acid attached to the P site tRNA. And that orange one further down was attached to the tRNA we already got rid of. As everything moves one spot to the left, that purple amino acid moves or stays in place and attaches itself to the green amino acid through another peptide bond being formed. Okay, And so as this progresses, we are going to see the continued extension of this polypeptide, this string of amino acids. Okay, So after this happens for a long time, what we end up with is we get towards the end and we come to, in this instance, UGA. If you look at your codon chart, and I will provide you with codon charts on your exams, you don't have to memorize the codon chart. UGA is a stop codon, okay? It terminates the process of translation. Note also that we have read this messenger RNA from the five prime to the three prime direction, okay? So we make DNA in the five to three, we make RNA in the five to three, we read DNA three to five, because when we make DNA or make RNA, we're making it five to three and it has to be anti-parallel. So we read DNA in the three to five, but when we read RNA, we're reading it five to three, okay? So everything is five to three, make DNA, make RNA, read RNA, except for reading DNA. Reading DNA is the only thing that occurs in the three to five direction. Okay, so we have read this messenger RNA to its three prime end at the terminus, where we find a stop codon or a termination codon. And we have a very long polypeptide attached to the last tRNA attached to the last codon that preceded the stop codon. And what we have here is a process whereby there's no tRNA that comes in and binds to the stop codon, okay? What it is, is called a release factor, okay? And it's not shown in this illustration, unfortunately, um, but there is a molecule called a release factor that comes in and binds to the stop codon of the messenger RNA and it blows everything up, okay? It releases the polypeptide from that last tRNA. It breaks apart the ribosome into two parts. The, all the tRNAs are now free and uncharged. The messenger RNA molecule still exists, but it's no longer clamped inside the ribosome. Okay, so now we have all the raw materials that we started with, except all the tRNAs are uncharged and the amino acids are strung together in a chain, a polypeptide chain. So 
The interesting part is that the ribosomes can be reused. The messenger RNA can be reused or continue to be translated. And the tRNAs uh, can be recharged. But this polypeptide is no longer going to participate in the process of translation. Its synthesis is now complete, but its arrangement and organization is not yet complete. So these polypeptides get strung together in very complex ways and folded back upon one another. Um, but I'm going to talk to you first about the scale of translation. Okay? Just like when we talked about DNA replication, I made clear to you that replication of your chromosomes doesn't just happen in one spot, start at one end and work its way all the way to the other end. That would be horribly inefficient. So your replication starts in multiple places and goes in lots of directions so that you can copy the whole chromosome really quickly. Transcription, remember, happens in massive multiplex fashion, meaning that the same gene is transcribed by multiple polymerases at the same time. So you end up making lots of messenger RNAs, for example. Here, what I'm showing you is that the same messenger RNA is translated by many ribosomes simultaneously. And so here you can see an example of a prokaryotic cell in which there are many ribosomes translating the exact same messenger RNA molecule at the same time. Okay, And you can see on the right that from each of these ribosomes is a polypeptide chain. Each of those ribosomes is translating the exact same thing, making the same protein. But again, your cell doesn't just need one molecule of that protein. Okay, You make lots of molecules of it from mes every messenger RNA that has been produced. Okay. So if you zoom in here, you can see that as you go from left to right, those polypeptides get longer because the ribosomes are adding more and more amino acids to those polypeptides. Your text speaks a little bit about the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic translation. Um, it's not a huge deal. Uh, the complexity, we're not going to get into a whole lot, but I just want you to see that eukaryotes have a pretty interesting system in which we've got this locked down in a pretty organized fashion such that your linear messenger RNA molecule represented by the orange string here, the orange line, is pinned around in a circle head to tail and you'll note you see the methylguanosine cap here and the poly A tail. These are important components of this closed loop being formed of the messenger RNA and what the ribosomes do is they just simply do the loop and translate and translate and translate. Once they reach the end towards the poly A tail, you'll see that they disassociate into large and small subunit and they go right back to the beginning, which is right there and close back up right on the start codon with the, in the P site, a tRNA methionine comes into that P site and the whole process starts again for that same uh, ribosome. Okay. All right, so there are a couple of things that your text then goes into with respect to how we understood and learned about the results of translation, okay? So the interesting aspect of the history of our understanding of the role of these proteins that are produced through the process of translation is that an early scientist, Garrod, who was not necessarily a geneticist, that, that uh, position or uh, profession did not exist at the time, but he had uh, physicians in the family and he was interested in an observed pattern whereby certain diseases were quite common within certain family groups. And this particular disease, Alcaptonuria, occurs when individuals are incapable of breaking down homogentisic acid, so bottom left, into malleolacetic acid, okay? I don't 
don't think I said that one right, but you get the gist. Okay, so the reason they can't do it is because they don't produce a very particular protein. The protein that they don't produce is due to this alcaptonuria block in which they do not transcribe and translate a gene correctly producing a functional and proper protein. And so in his exploration of the heritability of this disease and the result of this uh, genetic disorder or the accumulation of this homogentistic acid, because they can't break, break it down, is due to the absence of a particular protein. And so in making these observations, section 13.5 goes through this, but he made the clear conclusion that these things that are passed genetically from parent to offspring actually code for something, and the differences that arise are because there are alternate forms that are passed from parent to offspring. And the offspring might have certain combinations that don't allow them to produce functional proteins. Now, it was studies of a organism called Neurospora that led us to the conclusion that each gene actually codes for one particular enzyme. So this is this one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. In this study of uh, Neurospora, a bread mold, uh, two researchers, Beetle and Tatum, made a really interesting approach or uh, attempt to identify the effects of mutations and how individuals that differed in their phenotype, what was the basis of that mutation? because we understand individuals receive information from their parents and they appear similar to their parents, but what is the, the actual basis of that? Uh, it's coded for by the DNA, right? We've, we've learned about that in bacterial experiments, but what, how is that information taken from the DNA and um, utilized within the organism? So they created mutants of this bread mold by exposing them to x-rays or UV radiation, right? So you can see, you know, that illustrated on the far left. And what they would do is they would take these normal and these mutant um, forms of this bread mold and grow them in media. They'd grow them in complete medium and minimal medium. And you should remember what the difference is between those. Uh, and that is that complete medium has everything the organism could need, even the things that it is supposed to be able to make on its own. Minimal media is just the basics, the things that it cannot make on its own. And so when they observed that some of these uh, mold were not able to grow on minimal media, they knew, even though they could grow on complete medium, they knew that they weren't able to do something. They had induced a mutation in those pink conidia, uh, those spores of this bread mold, that made it so they couldn't make everything they're supposed to be able to make and grow on minimal media, okay? So they have some nutritional mutation that they had induced through these x-rays. And this is very similar to what we talked about with bacteria, okay? Now, what's interesting is they then took those mutant conidia that could grow on complete media but not on minimal media, and then they started systematically removing the different components of that complete medium, right? So they tried them on minimal media, they didn't grow. They tried them on minimal media, supplementing, just giving them vitamins. And it wasn't vitamins that they weren't able to produce because they still didn't grow. So they tried them on minimal media, adding purines and pyrimidines, okay? So nucleic acids and they still couldn't grow. But then they tried growing them on minimal media and adding amino acids, and boom, that was what they were able to grow on, okay? So they grew only when the media was supplemented with amino acids, okay? So then they took it to the next step and grew it with each of the different amino acids that were provided in the complete medium, and they identified, okay, perfect. There's only one amino acid that they're not able to make, 
because they can grow on minimal media if we add only tyrosine, just one amino acid. And so this is a particular amino acid that is produced through the process of transcription and translation of genetic information in the DNA of this bread mold. And so they realized that they had probably introduced a mutation into one little spot of the genome of this neurospora. And that mutation had broken one thing. One gene product was broken, okay? One enzyme or one gene product was no longer functional. And so they learned from this that a single gene results in the production of a single product. In this case, the gene that they had affected was the one responsible for the production of tyrosine. Okay. Now it was subsequent studies of human blood groups that refined this hypothesis. The study of human blood types and specifically a genetic disorder known as sickle cell anemia led researchers to conclude that not only is there one gene for every uh, one enzyme, but they refined that slightly to one gene, one polypeptide. And that'll make a bit more sense when we get to how the polypeptides that result from translation are actually processed once they're made. Because you'll note that at the end of the process of translation, I spoke not of proteins, but of polypeptides, okay? And sickle cell anemia is a really interesting example. We'll, we'll talk about this a bit more later in the course, assuming we have time, but it is one in which it's a genetic disorder that's most common in the areas highlighted here. So the darker the color, the more common it is. It's quite abundant in Africa and also um, India and the Saudi Arabian Peninsula and also parts of the Mediterranean. This allele found in humans is quite common in areas that are affected by the malarial parasite. So it's a, a mosquito-borne parasite that causes a very severe illness and individuals with this mutation are resistant to malaria. Okay. So the green on the map on the right indicates where malaria is found. So it's no coincidence that the sickle cell allele is most common in areas where malaria occurs. But it's also a mutation that affects the shape of the red blood cells, as you saw on the previous slide. They're a bit more pointy and half moon shaped. And this affects their ability to transport oxygen. And it's a result of the hemoglobin molecule that is produced through transcription and translation. That, that protein is not functioning properly because the polypeptide has been altered through the process of mutation. Now, uh, your text used to include this figure. They now include only the very bottom part of this figure, I believe. Uh, yep, uh, figure 13, 13. And it show, this shows the whole picture of how the researchers used gel electrophoresis, not necessarily of the, um, the DNA itself, but of the proteins and the polypeptides. And what they saw is that in the individuals that have sickle cell anemia, they have a peptide that is altered in shape and function, okay? And it all really boils down to this bottom part that you see here, portion C of the figure, where you see the polypeptide. Each of the amino acids is indicated by a three-letter code. Um, this is a quite common way to indicate different amino acids. And you'll note that the difference between a normal hemoglobin A molecule and a sick sickle cell, sorry, yeah, in a sickle cell hemoglobin molecule is this one amino acid number six in which there has been a mutation to the DNA that when the, the gene is transcribed and then translated you get a different amino acid in the polypeptide and this is the reason we have a very different phenotype or appearance or function of this polypeptide 
uh, in these individuals that bear this mutation. Okay, so the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis was broken down to the one gene, one polypeptide hypothesis because enzymes and proteins are not necessarily comprised of just a single polypeptide. Okay, hemoglobin is a great example because your hemoglobin in your red blood cells is not just one polypeptide folded up into a functional protein. It's different hemoglobin genes that have been expressed producing two different polypeptides that are put together to form the functional hemoglobin. And so this gets into a bit of the last section of your chapter, which is on protein structure, okay? So if we think about proteins, and I've been talking a lot about polypeptides, I want to make clear that polypeptides and proteins are not the same thing. What you see up at the top here is a polypeptide, a bunch of these amino acids strung together in a chain, just like we saw in the beginning illustrations of translation. But these must be folded into a very complex and very precise three-dimensional structure. Okay? And when these things don't get folded properly, we have problems. Okay? If the protein can't fold in the proper way, you end up with something like sickle cell. And it's folded the incorrect way because the amino acids aren't in the right order. You don't have the right amino acids there. It can't fold and bend and twist in the way it is supposed to. Okay? And so uh, some of these consequences can be quite severe. Some of them are genetic. Others can be influenced by other things, so like mad cow disease. This is something that's touched on in your text. Um, but mad cow disease is a change in the shape of the proteins, okay, the secondary structure of the polypeptide that affects the utility of these proteins. They no longer function as they should, okay? So what I want you to see here, this is a, a really nice illustration that I pulled from the internet that shows the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure of proteins, okay? Now the primary structure is just the string of amino acids in a polypeptide, okay? And so I'm gonna go through these three or four different levels here uh, and, and as we end the chapter. And I encourage you to be familiar with these hierarchical levels, organization of what ends up being a protein, okay? So we start out with these peptide bonds that are formed when two amino acids are stuck together, okay? This peptide bond is formed through this dehydration reaction. So you can see that a byproduct of it is water and the peptide bond is formed sticking these two amino acids together. This is how those two amino acids that are in the P site and the A site get stuck together. Now, once you have this string of amino acids, this polypeptide, they are arranged into a secondary structure, okay? So here you can see two different common secondary structures for polypeptides, uh, and you don't necessarily need to know the difference between these or be able to recognize an image of them. I just want you to recognize that these polypeptides can be, these strings of amino acids can be strung together and twisted in a way that configures or uh, looks like a, a helix, this alpha helix on the left, or in this beta pleated sheet form, okay? Either way, these are secondary organizational structures of these polypeptides, okay? It's the second level of folding and arrangement of these amino acids that are strung together. The tertiary structure is taking all of these alpha helices and beta pleated sheets and folding them into a three-dimensional structure, okay? So now what we have here is a single polypeptide that is some portion of it, an alpha helix, some portion beta pleated sheets, and it's three-dimensional, okay? Now that may not be the complete functional protein because as I described in the case of hemoglobin and what's illustrated here is actually insulin, many of these proteins or enzymes 
are not just a single polypeptide that's folded up into a proper tertiary structure. The quaternary structure or final structure of many proteins and enzymes is one that is the result of the assembly of a number of different tertiary structures. So you see here chain A and chain B, these are two different tertiary structures of two different polypeptides that are the result of the gene expression, transcription and translation of gene A and gene B. Totally different genes, totally different mRNAs, totally different polypeptides. You get totally different tertiary structures here. And then you stick these different things together into what you see on the right. You're looking at a top and a side view of the same molecule. And that is the functional molecule or enzyme. This is the functional insulin molecule. molecule okay, So you'll remember when we were talking about the structure of ribosomes early on, right? They have some rRNA in there and then 31, N, or 31 proteins or 31 enzymes. All of those are folded together in a very specific way to form the functional molecule. And that is what we end up with when we produce proteins, okay? So this is the end of our discussion of translation. And in ending it, I want to come back to one thing that I want to make sure that you're very clear on. Because as you know, the process of translation starts with transcription. You go to the DNA, make an RNA copy, and then you translate that RNA with ribosomes and tRNA. And then you've got a polypeptide you fold up into pieces. Okay. Now, one of the things that's very interesting to me that has tripped up students in the past is that for some reason, just because they've learned DNA replication and transcription and translation, they for some reason think that for transcription and translation to happen, you have to have DNA replication happen first. If that were the case, you would only ever have gene expression right after mitosis. And that is not what's happening, okay? Recognize that despite the fact they are kind of similar things going on with transcription and replication, you don't need one for the other to happen, okay? DNA replication is completely separated from transcription and translation. They are independent processes. Every cell in your body is constantly transcribing at least something and translating something, okay? Most of the cells in your body are not undergoing mitosis or meiosis right now. DNA replication is not happening at a very high level in your body but there's a boatload of transcription and translation happening, okay?